Ever wondered what you're going to get in a box of aftermarket connecting rods? You probably shouldn't, it's pretty self-explanatory. We've purchased an LS1 motor here recently at HPA and we're doing a stroker build on it to generate some new worked examples for our courses. We've had to purchase some connecting rods and we figured it'd be a really good opportunity to unbox them on camera and talk about some of the features particular to aftermarket connecting rods like the K1 technology ones that we have here. So, we'll tear into this thing. So as we can see the box has had a little bit of a hard time in shipping. Uh, but the way they've packaged them in here, we don't really expect that to be a particularly big deal as they are all separated from one another by these pieces of cardboard. And that might seem like a very small thing, but it is actually really important with items like this, is you don't want them to be able to bang into one another um, during shipping as small, uh, the small imperfections they would create on the surface finish can actually be a reasonably big deal once they've been in service for quite a time. Other bits and pieces we've got in the box here, some stickers, always important for your toolbox game. We've got some printed documentation, so this is going to be K1's installation guidelines and some torque settings down here. Uh, they've given them to you in both a stretch method and a torque and angle method, so that's really nice to see. We have some assembly lubricant. This is really, really important, and when we get to talking about the rod bolts uh, that are used in these connecting rods, we'll go into why. I do like that they've actually put it in a separate plastic bag, as these have a really annoying tendency to leak and destroy all the documentation. So that's really great. And we've got a final piece of documentation here. This is going to be the individual weights of all the rods, and an average weight. And the two weights down here are going to be the average weight of the rotational assembly, so that's basically the big ends, and the reciprocating assembly, so that's going to be the little ends of the rod. Uh, would have been nice if they'd printed this on something a little bit more robust, and I would have really liked to see the weights listed against the serial numbers that are on the rods. But uh, one of the things we're going to do during this video is actually weigh these rods and compare it to the documentation, so we'll be able to match all those up. So looking at one of the rods here, uh, if you've seen one connecting rod, you've probably seen a lot of them. It can be a little bit tricky to actually spot the differences. Uh, the first thing that leaps out at me at these is the very nice surface finish they've got. So they have been shot peened after forging. And shot peening is a process where they bombard the surface here with uh, small glass or metallic balls. You can think of it a lot like sandblasting, except that it's not abrasive at all. Uh, what it does is compress and unify the surface, and that uh, eliminates any stress raises that might have been left over from the machining or forging process. It's really, really important, particularly on an item like a connecting rod that's going to be in an engine, uh, a reciprocating assembly, and subject to uh, tensile and compressive forces millions and millions of times over its lifespan, uh, any small stress raises can lead to possible cracking, so you want to eliminate those if possible. Looking at the little end here, we can see we've got some oiling holes, uh, so that means this rod is going to rely on the oil mist inside the crankcase for lubrication. We've got a brass uh, gudgeon pin bush, that means the gudgeon pin installation is going to be known as a fully floating installation. That means the gudgeon pin will be free to rotate inside the small end here and inside the piston. Uh, it's pretty typical on a performance application. These brass bushes are actually replaceable, so if you suffer any engine damage and the surface in here does get marred or marked and is no longer usable, your engine machinist should be able to remove this bush and uh, replace it with a new one and hone it back to size. Moving down the length of the Conrod, uh, we can see they are forged. There's not really any massively visible parting lines, which is really nice. Uh, that surface finish is really nice and smooth. An H-beam design, so that's going to be applicable for our engine build, as we're not looking for massive RPMs. We are looking to make a lot of our power uh, down low in the rev range. We can see that they've laser engraved their K1 Technologies logo onto the rods. That really looks quite nice on there. And if we move down to the business end of the rod, that's going to be the big end where all the uh, important stuff happens. We can see we've got a nice surface finish on the side of the rod that'll be against the other connecting rod here. And on the other side we've got a nice chamfer here to clear the fillet radius on the crankshaft. Now while this isn't K1 Technologies lightweight series of rods, we can see they have still given some thought into reducing weight where they can. Uh, they've thinned out the middle section here in relation to these journal widths, and they've continued that down through the side bosses here where the fasteners secure. 
Now speaking of fasteners, the rods are supplied with ARP's 2000 series fasteners. Uh, while they're not quite as strong as ARP's L19 series, they are going to be absolutely fine for our application, as when this is installed in the engine, uh, the only time the rods are actually under any tensile stress is at the end of the exhaust stroke and uh, the beginning of the intake stroke, as that's when the conrod is really responsible for changing the direction of the piston. And the forces that these bolts are subjected to are really determined by engine speed, and uh, we're not anticipating having a really high revving engine, so the 2000 series is going to be absolutely fine for uh, what we're trying to do here. So if we pull one of these rod bolts out, we can have a closer look at them, as they are a really critical component of the assembly. And uh, I can see immediately that they've been supplied, coated in what I would assume is either an anti-seize or an anti-corrosive uh, substance. Not to be confused with the assembly lubricant you're going to use when doing your final assembly. So that's one of the reasons, even when you buy brand new parts like this, you do need to put them through a thorough cleaning process. K1 Technologies uh, part number on these rod bolts is a BT71401-2, which to be honest for, I actually had to look and find on their website. It wasn't included anywhere in the package documentation, and I would have liked to have seen it there, as we do need to know it when we are looking for our fastener torque here. So here's our part number. It's a 7 16th by 1.4 inch fastener, and if we were talking it via the rod uh, bolt stretch method, we'd be looking for 4.5 to 5 thou of stretch, and that's uh, 30 foot pounds plus uh, 50 degrees of rotation. So I'll pull the other fastener out, and we'll uh, separate the big end of the rod, and we'll have a slightly closer look at uh, some of the features that are going on there. Uh, now these will be doweled together, and the dowels will be pretty tight, so this might actually require a bit of force to get apart. Uh, but you want to apply that force as evenly as you can, and uh, try and avoid rocking things back and forth, as you don't want to uh, mar the material or uh, just create any stress points in there. With that apart, we can have a look at our big end here, uh, the bearing surface, or that is the surface that the bearings are going to sit on. Uh, it's been nicely ground, it's got a really good surface finish, really good pattern on there, very, very smooth. One of the things they have done that I really like is they've chamfered the edges on the bearing tang uh, receiver grooves here, and that means when you are installing a bearing into place, there's not going to be a chance of these uh, edges being sharp and actually galling the back of your bearing. Uh, that would sort of leave a bit of foreign debris floating around that if you can avoid, it's really, really good to when you're doing an engine assembly. Looking at our big end cap here, uh, we can see we've got same really nice surface finish, same chamfered edges on the bearing tang receivers, and uh, good dowels here that, as you can see, were pretty tight when we were uh, splitting these two. And that's going to ensure they'll be really well aligned when you're doing the engine assembly, which is very, very important. Uh, on the back side here, we've got our strengthening ribs, and they look very, very prominent on these rods, but I suspect that's actually more to do with material being removed from the center here uh, to make the rotational weights uh, a little bit less, and uh, those ribs there are going to provide all the necessary strength. Now one thing I haven't actually mentioned yet is these are a forged conrod, and they're made out of a 4340 chromoly steel, so that is reasonably industry standard for an aftermarket conrod these days. Uh, it's got a really high tensile strength, and it's going to be absolutely up to the task of our stroked LS1 application. What we're going to do now is I'm going to reassemble this with its rod bolts back in place. I'm going to create a spreadsheet that's got all of our uh, rod serial numbers here, and then we're going to weigh each of the rods individually, and uh, check that the weights that we get here match up with the uh, documentation that K1 Technologies have supplied. And then we're going to go one step further than that, and we're actually going to separately weigh the uh, sort of reciprocating assembly and the rotational assembly, and check that they're reasonably even across the rods. Now, I don't expect these measurements to completely match up with the documentation we've got from K1 here, as their testing methodology might be different to what we're using here. What we're actually looking for is for it to be even across all our rods, and it's going to give us, give us a really good idea of where we need to remove material if we do have to match the weights of these rods at all. So due to the magic of the editing, the next shot we're going to see uh, will have reassembled this rod, 
and I'll have my scale fixture set up here on the bench. We'll get some measurements and we'll see how things are going to stack up. So I've got all my equipment and the rods laid out. Everything's in a nice logical order so we'll be able to go through this quickly uh, but make sure that we don't lose our place at all and uh, mix up any measurements. If you're undertaking this task at home, you really want to make sure you've got a good quality set of digital scales that have a resolution of at least 0.1 of a gram. For our LS1 Stroker build here, uh, 0.1 of a gram is the tolerance we're going to be aiming for and matching the weights of all these rods. Uh, so the process is very much like you would expect. We'll turn our scales on. We will make sure they're teared out to zero. And we will select our first rod. And we've got a measurement there of 648.9 grams. And I'm actually just going to get this from another direction. Uh, it shouldn't make any difference uh, with the way these scales are set up. And we can see that it doesn't. But I just really like to verify that measurement. A uh, really good thing to do. So I'm going to take this number here, enter it into my spreadsheet. And then I'm going to go through and do the rest of the rods. And once that's done, we'll talk about the results. So we've actually got some really interesting results out of that process. K1 Technologies state that the rods will be balanced to within plus or minus one gram of their nominal weight, which is 650 grams. I've measured the heaviest rod to have a weight of 651.5 grams and the lightest rod to have a weight of 648.9 grams. So both those rods are actually slightly outside of that specification. There is also a variance across the rods uh, weights of 2.6 grams and that is reasonably significant. So we do know that we're going to have some balancing work to get all those weights in line. It's another reason we have a saying here at HPA uh, which is trust but verify. We trust that these are really good quality rods that are going to be fantastic for our application but we've verified that there is some balancing work that we're going to need to do. Now to undertake that balancing work, I'm going to use our fixture here, which will allow me to measure the weights of the little end and the big end of the rod somewhat separately, and that's going to let us know where we need to remove our material. This fixture does require a little bit of dialing in and setup, so I'm going to go ahead and do that now. So with our fixture set up, we can really delve into the weights of these con rods and make sure they're all going to be balanced really evenly in both the rotational assembly and the reciprocating assembly. Uh, the way this fixture works is it's got a support pin and boss here, which we put the small end of the con rod on, and that all runs on uh, low friction roller bearings, and that helps to minimize the effects uh, any friction has on our measurement. Uh, on this fixture here, which is sitting on top of our scales, we then put the big end of the con rod, and that gives us a measurement of just the big end of the con rod. This fixture does require a little bit of setup and dialing in as the distance between the scales here and the support boss does make quite a big difference to the reading. Uh, so what we're really looking for is to make sure that the scales and the fixture on top of the scales here don't move at any stage when we're undertaking our measurements for all our rods as then we've got a good set of comparable data. Uh, I've made sure that's the case here by temporarily adhering these, uh, this fixture to the scales and the scales to this base plate. Uh, so it's not going to move while I'm taking the rods on and off. So with that done, we can go ahead and get a measurement of our first con rod here. So I'm just going to square up the face of the con rod here to the face of the fixture and I'll do that uh, as close as I can for every single con rod as I want to avoid any uh, error in our measurements uh, creeping in from the position of the con rod so I'll try and keep that as much the same as I can for all the measurements and then I like to give it a wee uh, disturbance here and just let it settle and uh, that tends to give us reasonably repeatable measurements. So we've got a measurement there of 462.5 grams. I'll record that on my spreadsheet. And then to minimize the error even further, I'm actually going to make that same measurement four more times. And then on my spreadsheet, I will discard the lowest measurement and the highest measurement, and I will average the other three. And that should give us a really good set of reliable data. So I'll go ahead and do that now. 12 seconds later. So we've got some really nice repeatable results there. Got an average weight for our rod, the big end of our rods, of 462.6 grams. I had a minimum measurement of 462.5 and a maximum measurement of 462.7. So that's all really nice and repeatable. What I'm going to do now is go ahead and measure the rest of the eight rods and uh, we'll then have a look at the results and we'll have a talk about how we would go ahead and remove material to make all the rods match the minimum weight that we've seen. 
So with that procedure undertaken, we have managed to get a good data set on the big end weights of our rods. The minimum measurement we've seen was actually the first measurement we made at 462.6 grams, and the maximum measurement was 464.67 grams. So there is a bit of a variance there. Now the way we would correct this is we would take our heaviest rod, which uh, incidentally was actually the rod we measured to be the heaviest when just measuring its uh, static weight as well, which does make sense. Uh, we'd take this rod and we would remove material from it until its big end weight uh, matched the smallest measurement we got. Uh, which was that first measurement that we took. Now to do that we have to ensure that we don't really interfere with our measurement fixture too much. We want to leave that set up. Uh, as we're not installing these rods in the engine yet, we're not going to go ahead and undertake that procedure right now, but we can still talk about how we would do it. So we would use a linisher and we would remove material from the rods uh, along the side of the, the rod bolt bosses here. Uh, just giving a chamfer to this edge to get the big end of the rod down to the weight that we need. What we absolutely would not do is remove material from the strengthening ribs on the back of the big end here. I have seen engine builders do this in the past and it's definitely not a good idea as that is a critical area and you don't want to remove any material from there if you can avoid it. So once that was done, with the weights of the big ends of our rods now all matched, we need to match the overall weights of our rods. Uh, to do this, we re-weigh each rod, and we record all the measurements, and we look, at, look for the minimum weight of the rods. We then remove material from the very top of the pin boss here to bring all the rods down to within 0.1 of a gram of that minimum weight. And the reason we remove material in this stage of the balancing process from just the very top of the pin boss is it ensures that our big end weights all remain uh, balanced, so that's going to keep the rotational assembly balanced, uh, and it's then going to ensure that the small end weights are going to be as close as we can get them, and that's going to keep the reciprocating mass balanced as well. So there we have it, a set of aftermarket K1 Technologies forged connecting rods for an LS1 stroker application in this instance. Now if you'd like to see more of that LS1 build, make sure you're following our social media channels as we will be posting up details on it as we progress through it.